are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on electrical safety testing uh, 102. I am your presenter, Syed Abidi, um, also the applications engineer here at Associated Research. And um, also joining us today are Nick Petrowski, who's uh, also one of our presenters and the technical project leader. And then we have uh, um, Jim Kennessy uh, as the organizer, who will be helping us uh, with any technical issues, audio, video, and if you need uh, information on the presentation, you can <clears throat> request it uh, uh, via our chat line. And uh, Nick Petrowski will be answering um, our questions on the chat line, so feel free to utilize that feature. So before we get into uh, the real meat of the material, um, this webinar is basically on electrical safety testing 102. Uh, we also had a webinar uh, on the same topic 101 uh, previously, which was presented by Nick, and uh, we're going to quickly go over what was covered in that webinar. But before all that, we're going to just uh, take a quick look at uh, some of our notes here. Um, we encourage you to utilize our Q&A facility um, uh, via the chat line and like I said Nick will be available to answer any of your questions any questions relating to running of the meeting um, audio or video can be addressed to our host Jim Kennessy through the chat line also know that this webinar like with all our webinars is being recorded and will be available uh, to view usually within a day uh, on our website if you would like uh, a copy of this presentation, again, feel free to email Jim Kennessy at jimk at asresearch.com or request it through the chat line. So I hope everyone's uh, here and we're going to go ahead and start with our presentation for today. Um, first of all, just a quick overview or recap of what was covered in our last webinar, which was Electrical Safety Testing 101. So basically in that webinar, Nick uh, covered uh, basics of electrical safety, what is the meaning of safety, um, and then um, some of the electrical shock hazards that are associated with the electricity uh, and using electronic products, and then some examples were th given out of uh, safe and unsafe testing methods and uh, safe and unsafe test stations and basic info on uh, you know safety and also we provided some training resources for you guys some websites some links and uh, you know some uh, safety standard agencies and all that good stuff so that was electrical safety testing 101 102 we're gonna um, you know uh, continue with the, where Nick left off and we're going to actually dive into um, the test types. We're going to go and under, try and understand um, the ba some of the basic electrical safety tests and then some of the uh, test requirements where these tests are required. We're going to talk a little bit about where the requirements come from and uh, then we're going to help you, uh, you know, find the right testing device for your testing. We're going to give you some tips on how to go about finding the right tester for your testing and we're also going to give you some tips on what not to do when you're performing some of the electrical safety tests. So here is the quick list of uh, the most common electrical safety tests that uh, most of our instruments are able to perform and uh, most and all, most of these tests are also required by, uh, if not all, most of the electrical safety uh, test standards. The first test being the ground continuity test, um, followed by the ground bond test, then the dielectric withstand test, also known as the HIPAA test, then the insulation resistance test, and lastly the touch current test, or more commonly known as the line leakage test. Now we're gonna briefly cover uh, these test types uh, 
Um, we're not going to go into too much detail because we have more webinars planned this year uh, which are dedicated to each test type. So we're going to go into a lot more detail in those webinars. But if you do have any questions, uh, once again, do use our chat line and we'll definitely try to answer those uh, to the best of our capability. Now before we actually talk about those uh, specific tests that we just looked at, it is very important to know as a manufacturer and as a test engineer or a compliance engineer, what are the, how these tests are categorized. So basically all the electrical safety tests are categorized by um, type tests or production line tests or routine tests. So type tests are tests that are conducted at engineering level, meaning when the product is, product is going through, you know, uh, is, in, is in its design phase, um, the, these are the tests that are required um, during uh, the design phase of the product. It's conducted on samples of product by the manufacturer and sometimes by the safety agency to get compliance. The, uh, the main objective of type tests is to determine if a product as designed and manufactured meets the requirements of the standards. So again, um, type tests are performed during the design phase of a product and uh, safety standards of course are designed to ensure product safety. Um, these design, these type tests and both production line tests do uh, you know, um, originate from the safety standard that you're trying to comply with. And those standards are set forth to, to guide um, the manufacturers on the type of tests they need to run in order to get compliance. So basically type tests are again designed to verify the design integrity of a product and they're much more rigorous than production line tests because of course this is a design phase and the manufacturer wants to be sure that there is nothing's being left behind and everything is being covered. Then the next uh, category of tests is the routine test or also known as production line tests. These are, um, you know, these could be the same test type as under the type test, but um, the way they're performed, uh, the method may be slightly different in terms of some of the parameters or, you know, some of the test times. So these are performed, uh, production line tests or routine tests are performed on each product at the end of production line. So here's the big difference, you know, so type tests are performed during the design phase, whereas routine tests are performed products when they're fully assembled and ready to be, um, you know, shipped out in the market. These are usually performed by the manufacturer on fully assembled products and they're designed to ensure safety of the end user of the product. Um, some of the tests that we just looked at, dielectric withstand, ground continuity, and functional run, these are commonly specified as 100% routine tests. However, depending on the type of product, you know, additional tests may be specified by the test standard uh, or the manufacturer as routine tests and the safety agency to guarantee acceptable level of compliance with the safety standard. So before we get into uh, talking in more detail about uh, some of the tests we just looked at, um, we're going to do a quick poll and uh, you know, add, get your opinion on what routine safety tests are you running. So we're going to take a, a minute pause there and uh, let you, uh, you know, uh, provide your input. Okay, Syed, we have uh, most, most everyone's voted by now. Um, 
So I just want to share some results with you. 81% uh, uh, are performing HIPAA tests, 59% are performing continuity, 67 ground bond, uh, 52 uh, IR, and then we have 37% uh, performing line linkage. All right. Thanks a lot, Jim, for sharing those results. And um, so it looks like <clears throat> most of you are performing uh, a lot of these tests and um, so that's, that's good to know. That's great input for us. Um, we're going to move on um, with our presentation. And once again, thank you for taking uh, you know, a minute to answer the poll questions. So the first test we're going to talk about here is our ground continuity test. This test is as simple as taking a digital multimeter our resistance meter with two probes and you know connect touching one probe at one end of a <clears throat> of a circuit and uh, the other probe at the other end and just testing for continuity just just seeing if that circuit is continuous so this uh, the ground continuity test verifies a connection between exposed conductive parts and the ground of the power cord on the product under test now remember and the, uh, for those of you who were not able to attend our previous webinar, <clears throat> we did mention um, uh, how electric uh, electronic products are classified uh, under class one and class two type products. So basically, class one products uh, uh, have a ground pin or a ground conductor, a ground circuit associated with them, whereas class two products do not have a ground pin or a ground circuit. Instead, they have a dual layer of insulation. So now this being the ground continuity test uh, applies only to class one products, uh, testing the ground circuit of those products. It's a, a routine production line test, um, which is conducted on class one products. The way this test is performed, again, is a low voltage AC or DC signal is applied from the chassis of the product to the ground pin. And you know, just a, a basic measurement is taken uh, in ohms, uh, verifying the integrity, verifying the connection. There is a continuous ground connection from the chassis to the ground pin, which ensures that the safety ground connection is continuous. It is basically, uh, or ba typically performed at a current under one amps to check that the ground connection is continuous. So again, a very basic test. Um, usually performed at the start of the test sequence to verify if a uh, ground a uh, circuit or a connection is continuous. The next test is a more rigorous one and it also has to do with the ground circuit of a uh, class one product. Unlike the ground continuity test, the ground bond test basically not only just uh, you know uh, tells us if there is a continuous ground connection but it also verifies the integrity of the ground connection between the exposed metal and ground wire of the product. The way a ground bond test is performed is high current is injected into the ground pin of the product's power cord, which follows, which flows through the chassis, and uh, the return uh, connection is uh, connected on a good chassis point to make the measurement. Basically this test determines if the safety ground wire is capable of handling excessive current flow in case a fault occurs and the product's insulation fails. So let's take a quick look at the circuit for the ground bond test. The ground bond test, like I said, is, uh, you know, it's a high current test and um, if you look at this picture, we, uh, you'll see the dashed green line showing how the high current is injected into the ground pin of a product and the return connection is made on the chassis point of, a, of the product and a, measurement, a four wire measurement is made in some cases. Some of our testers do use a Kelvin connection, a four wire connection to offset the lead resistance and um, some some uh, some of our instruments do not have a four wire uh, method, but <clears throat> in any case, the result of a ground bond test is uh, in ohms and gives you um, a measure of the 
the resistance of the ground circuit of your product. Here's uh, another diagram showing a quick fail condition that the, basically this means that the ground circuit of your product has failed uh, for a high current test and it should be um, basically checked or replaced or you know repaired. Um, few other uh, considerations for ground bond tests are that this again this step is a test is commonly st uh, specified as a type test. The results of the test are displayed in ohms and the catch here is that the ground conductor of a product must have a low enough impedance to handle any fault current. So in case a fault current, you know, something goes wrong in your product and there's a, you know, a fault current uh, uh, within your product, the ground conductor sh or the ground circuit should be low enough impedance since current is always going to follow the path of the least resistance. So the ground circuit should be uh, a very low impedance circuit. And um, here's another picture of how <coughs> we can use one of our um, high amp three models, which is a standalone ground bond tester. How it can be used uh, to perform the ground bond test. Uh, as you can see, the red wire coming out of the tester is connected to the ground pin of a three prong product. Uh, um, in this case, a drill machine. And the return connection is made on the chassis of the product to make the four-wire connection. Now, a couple other things about ground bond tests is that if, uh, since this test also verifies that the ground, um, you know, connection is continuous, uh, if a ground bond test is being performed, usually a ground continuity test is not necessary. But again, um, the best way to find out what tests are required uh, for your product um, this, the safety standard that you're trying to comply with is your best resource in terms of uh, finding out the types of tests and how they should be performed. Yeah, I um, A couple other considerations uh, <clears throat> for the ground bond test. Again, the parameters for this test, they vary from standard to standard. And uh, again, you know, uh, manufacturers must consult the safety standard which they're trying to comply with before setting the test parameters. For example, UL60950 is our standard for IT equipment um, and calls out for the test current to be twice the fuse rating of the product or twice the current rating of the circuit under test. So here's an example of how this test standard will actually provide you with all the information on even setting up the parameters as well as the types of tests that are required for your product. Um, test voltage is not to exceed 12 volts and the duration of the test is to be 120 seconds. Again, an example right out of the IT standard. They're actually, um, you know, providing us with all the test parameters, so which makes things a lot easier. Um, the test current for uh, your ground bond test could be AC or DC based on the product and again, the safety standard may call out for an AC or a DC test. So your best resource is your safety standard. So before we go any further, I'd like to do a quick demo of, uh, or basically a quick uh, video of a ground bond test. And um, we're going to quickly show you how a ground bond test and a ground continu continuity test can be performed. So before uh, before I play the video, uh, I just want to do a quick uh, explain quickly what's going on in this uh, video. Basically, we have a load box, one of our own load boxes called TBB2. It's more of a verification box, but it has all the loads uh, to basically verify if your uh, electrical safety tester is passing and failing appropriately. So we've pre-programmed some uh, you know continuity and ground bond tests. Uh, one each for a failed condition and a pass condition. And uh, as you can see in the picture, the red uh, wire coming out of the electrical safety tester itself um, is connected to a load and the return, the black wire, the return wire is connected to the other end of the load. And um, the test is programmed for, our, for a continuity test and a ground bond test. So we're going to go ahead and play the video and see what happens here. 
So here's your continuity test. Again, the result was a pass, um, meaning there was good continuity. The next test here is a fail test showing a ground continuity fail. Now we're running a high current test, 30 amps, and we're seeing a resistance value of 62. And that was our passing condition. And next, our last test that we ran was a fail test, um, basically simulating a ground bond failure. And we're just going to quick, quickly go over the results here. And uh, so basically, the ground bond test, again, you know, it's, uh, it's required uh, as a as a type test, but when a ground continuity test is performed, ground bond test, uh, or in fact, when a ground bond test is being performed, a ground continuity test is not necessary. Next, we're going to look over um, one of the most commonly performed electrical safety tests, which is the dielectric fit stand test. Again, we're, um, like I said, we're going to be, you know, we have webinars dedicated for each of these tests and we're going to go into a lot more detail on each of these tests in the upcoming webinars so um, you know um, but if you do have questions along the way feel free to ask us and we'll definitely try to answer them so the next test that we're going to talk about is the dielectric bit stand test or more commonly known as the high pipe test also referred to as the high pipe test uh, this test is used to determine whether the insulation of a product uh, will be able to withstand an over voltage condition for a period of time without breaking down. So basically the high pot test, unlike a ground bond test where um, a high current is applied to the ground pin, here a, uh, basically this one is a deliberate application of high voltage potential between the mains input and any exposed dead metal of your product, meaning that there's a high voltage potential applied between the current carrying conductors of your product and the chassis ground. To stress the insulation, the resulting leakage current uh, due to the application of this high voltage is measured to determine whether a product's insulation is able to withstand the high voltage without breaking down. So the assumption here is that if your product will be able to withstand uh, uh, the application of such a high voltage, um, it should be, you know, it should be it's, uh, uh, okay for the rest of the life of the product. This, uh, the high pot test verifies that the insulation of a product is, product is capable of protecting the user from any leakage currents as a result of an electrical fault within the product, meaning basically this test is, is stressing the insulation hard and seeing you know how in some cases uh, again you know, going back to the standards some some standards will require you to look for actual breakdowns so sometimes you have a high limit set for a current and that you don't want to exceed for your product um, the high pot test can be a type test or routine test based on the standard that you're trying to follow um, it's used to detect possible defects in the design of a product and workmanship defects such as inadequate creepage or clearance distances between the current carrying conductors. Here's a basic circuit for a high pot test and uh, we're going to quickly look at how this test is performed. So basically on the left you can look at the electrical safety analy analyzer or the high pot tester on the right side is the product being tested. Um, the high voltage is being applied to the mains input on top of the picture the, the line and neutral of a product are shorted together all the mains conductors are shorted together and the high voltage is being applied between those mains conductors and the chassis ground this results in it basically um, stressing the insulation of your product and as a result a leakage current flows on the chassis of the product which can be measured using the return lead. And that gives us a, a, a measure of uh, how good the insulation is and how much leakage current is uh, basically f uh, going to flow. And uh, 
and the application of a high voltage on on a product basically you can think of this as uh, you know charging up a big capacitor and when you do that there's you know some uh, some uh, things that you have to consider that if you charge up a product you know you have to make sure proper discharge so there's uh, you know uh, a lot of high power test considerations that we're going to go into more detail in one of our other webinars but to quickly uh, kind of get a feel of this test, it's basically charging up a device and you know applying a very high voltage and looking for breakdowns or leakage current values. Here's another picture showing the uh, uh, high pot test resulting in a failure, meaning that the insulation of our product was not could not withstand a very high voltage and it broke down and in um, in such a condition, a very large amount of leakage current would be flowing on the chassis of the product, posing a, um, a you know a safety issue to the to whoever whoever comes in contact with this product. Some of, some other considerations for the high pot tests are that the leakage current again you know it's present in every product to some degree. This leakage current does become a problem when it reaches excessive levels due to dielectric breakdown. Dielectric in this case is the insulation of our product. The results of a high pot test are displayed in, in milliamps or microamps depending on the type of test. Um, now the high pot test is performed or can be performed on both a class 1 and a class 2 products and uh, it can also be performed in um, AC or DC mode based on again the safety standard which will basically call out whether an AC test is required or a DC test is required or if both AC and DC tests are required. The test voltage and again all the failure settings for this test uh, must be specified by the manufacturer in accordance with the safety standard. So again uh, I'd like to emphasize that um, the you must know which standard you're trying to which safety standard you're trying to comply with because that's your best resource of of learning and understanding what types of electrical safety tests are required for your product and how um, when what parameters should you be using for a high pot test a rule of thumb for calculating the high voltage uh, which most of the standards specify is twice the product's rated voltage uh, plus a thousand volts meaning so for example in the US if you have uh, you know a uh, line power coming in at 120 volts um, your high pot test voltage would be uh, 120 times 2 plus a thousand which is 1240 so that that would be your high pot voltage however again the st there are standards that specify different voltages for uh, different types of uh, high pot tests so it's uh, always a good idea to look at the standard. The next test in our uh, sequence is the insulation resistance test. Now the insulation resistance test is very similar to a DC withstand test or a DC high pot test meaning that it's uh, you know a DC potential is applied and it stresses the same insulation on a product as the high pot test uh, and probably that's why it's the most least commonly specified electrical safety test because a high pot test has already stressed the same insulation. But however, uh, the insulation resistance test does provide uh, the use or the manufacturer um, with uh, you know some good quantifiable values of the product insulation, and uh, it can give you a good uh, measure of how good the insulation of a product is. And if the, you know, if uh, any time in the near future the insulation may fail, it will give you a good indication of that. Um, it's uh, also commonly performed on service or repaired units to verify that the, as a result of the damage or the repairs, the product's insulation is still intact and is in good shape. So it's always a good idea to perform an IR test after a product uh, is repaired. The result of an insulation resistance test is uh, it differs from a high pot test uh, in that it gives you a measure of the resistance of the overall resistance of the product's insulation. 
unlike a hypot test, which gives you a current value, a leakage current value. Um, another difference between the hypot test and the insulation resistance test is that the IR test is usually run at a lower lower potential, um, or yeah, commonly run at a lower potential. In some cases, it may not be the it may not be the case, and the standard may ask you to you know run a, a IR test at you know a different potential, but um, normally, uh, a test voltage of 500 or 1,000 uh, volts is uh, used for the insulation resistance test. The higher the insulation of your of your product, um, the better it is. You know that means the insulation is in good shape and will be able to uh, hold uh, and you know uh, protect the user uh, for the life of the product. <clears throat> Some other considerations for um, the insulation resistance tests are that you know, like other electrical safety tests, test uh, parameters again vary upon the standard. For example, um, EN 60204-1, which is the standard for safety of machinery, specifies a 500 volt DC test between the power circuit conductors and the protective bonding circuit, and the resistance shall not be less than one mega ohm. So here's again our standard telling us exactly what we need to do or what we need to set for our insulation resistance test. And in the picture uh, in the, below this, you can see that um, we, how the insulation resistance test uh, setup looks like. It's like I said, it's very, very similar. It's, in fact, it's exactly the same as the high pot test. Uh, high voltage is applied to the mains uh, conductors of your product, in this case uh, a, a fan. And as you can see, the red wires where the high voltage is being applied by shorting the line in neutral of this product, and the return connection is made um, on the on the chassis of the product to measure the resistance of the insulation of your product. So before we go any further, we're going to do a. I'm going to show you another quick uh, demo of uh, our how. Uh, an AC and DC and insulation resistance test can be performed. So again, before I play this video, real quick, um, we're using a load box here, as uh, you know, which basically consists of a bunch of resistors and loads of known values, and we've set up a sequence of tests so that we can show a uh, AC, DC, and an IR test. Uh, AC withstand, DC withstand, and an insulation resistance test for a pass and a fail condition. I'm going to go ahead and play the video. Here, uh, here we have the AC high pot pass, and then um, the next connection we're going to clip the lead, the high current lead to the fail uh, port of our load box. as should result in a failure, a high limit total failure, meaning that the high limit of uh, uh, the current limit has been exceeded. Next is the DC high pot test uh, pass condition, um, and then followed by a DC high pot fail condition. So this should result in a failure, meaning that, again, you know, the current level has exceeded the threshold that was set. The next test is the insulation resistance test. Again, if you can see the difference in the results, the result is a high resistance value. And then we have our insulation resistance fail uh, test set up to show that the test uh, uh, has actually failed and the in the resistance of uh, the uh, of your product's insulation has uh, basically come out to be lower than a certain value that that you want it to be. Okay, so hopefully that video uh, uh, helps you guys uh, look at the high pot test and the uh, IR test and see how it's actually performed. Um, the next test that we're gonna talk about today is uh, probably one of the most uh, detailed or com you know complicated tests could get complicated depending on the product um, and that is our line leakage test also known as the touch current test so the line leakage test is very different from all the other safety tests that we talked about so going back to the ground continuity and ground bond those tests are basically you know, testing the ground circuit of a product of a class one product, whereas the high pots and the IRs are um, testing the insulation of your product. 
line leakage test is different from all the other tests in that um, when the line leakage test is performed, the product that you're testing or the product under test is actually powered on and it's uh, basically it's operating uh, and uh, unlike uh, the ground bond and the high pods, the product is not actually powered on. It's, the circuit is not energized in any of those tests. You're just stressing the insulation and testing the ground. Whereas in a line leakage test, it's performed on electrical safety products to measure the leakage current which could flow through a person while the product is operating. A measuring device, or a MB for short, is used to simulate the impedance of the human body under different conditions depending upon the application of the product. So a line leakage test basically uh, is used to measure leakage that could flow through a person's body and uh, some, some fault conditions are simulated on the, on the line input of the product. To, 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 to see how much leakage current will flow to the person in contact with the product as a result of those fault conditions. The test is run under both normal and single fault conditions and reverse polarity on the input line power at 110% of rated input. And line leakage test is most commonly performed on medical equipment. However, there are other standards who also call out for a line leakage test to be performed on, you know, some different types of products. But medical uh, medical uh, industry is uh, basically the biggest user of line leakage testing. Here is a typical circuit for a line leakage test. As you can see on the left, we have our uh, line leakage tester, and on the right side, the product being tested. Uh, the product is plugged in into the line leakage tester, powered up uh, at the rated voltage, and uh, there's some switches and relays used to simulate certain fault conditions that can uh, happen or are possible on the line input side of the device being tested. The, the measuring device of, for a line leakage test can vary from standard to standard. On the right, you can see a little circuit that's right out of the measuring device for EN60601-1, which is basically the big medical uh, uh, equipment standard. And um, as you can see, the measuring device is basically uh, consists of a few resistors, a capacitor. It's uh, basically a, um, a circuit um, that's used to measure the leakage, resulting leakage current in a product. Before we head any further, um, we're going to do another, we're going to request you to please participate in another poll. And hey, this time we're going to ask you how do you select your safety testing equipment because then we're going to give you some tips on how you should be selecting your safety tester and how we can help you do that. So please take another moment to participate in this poll and we're going to pause for a minute here. Okay, Syed, uh, we didn't have quite as many people participate in this, uh, this poll, um, which, okay. which I kind of understand. It's a little bit different question. Um, mm -hmm. But 88% based, um, chose based off testing standards. 19% uh, uh, were, were specified by their company. 4% um, uh, inherited from a different group. 42% uh, okay. researched and then uh, 8% uh, chose you know, the CE mark being on the equipment. Okay, thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm. 
All right. So once again, thank you for uh, taking a moment to participate in this uh, in our second poll of our today's webinar. And I know this question was kind of a little different. So, uh, but we do have some interesting results uh, or uh, you know answers or feedback from you guys. It looks like 80 percent, around 80 percent of you, uh, do look at the or or refer to the safety standard that you're trying to comply with which again is probably the best practice in my opinion. Um, you know, the safety standard should be your main guideline or guiding document in terms of uh, your electrical safety testing requirements and parameters. So, now that we've covered um, or basically kind of reviewed some of our uh, basic electrical safety tests, we are ready to give you some tips uh, on how you should go about finding the right tester and then we're going to talk about some of the things that you should not be doing while, electrical, while performing the electrical safety tests. So to start with, Associated Research has a complete line of electrical safety testers that are capable of performing the most common electrical safety tests. We have uh, test uh, equipment or, you know, that are standalone that can, for example, do just a ground bond, just a high pot, just an insulation resistance test. And then we have uh, combinations of different test types that can perform using uh, one, uh, you know, an all-in-one or two-in-one, four-in-one kind of uh, equipment. We have a full medical safety, I mean, electrical safety compliance analyzers and med medical test systems. We have uh, instruments for US and the international market with CE listing. Um, we also offer custom software and scanning matrices or you know switching matrices for complete automation meaning that we have you know we can, you can actually um, you know uh, custom build a test system for you where you can program all your tests, make all the test connections and with the click of a button um, our, the system will run through the entire test sequence on your product without any operator intervention. So that reduces the risk of operator error and also increases uh, safety. Um, we have other test accessories uh, to make testing simple, safe, and efficient. Um, uh, for example, the TVB2 box that we saw during our videos, that's like our own load box used to verify. And verification is another very important topic, and we will be uh, holding a webinar just on verification to emphasize on the importance of verifying your electrical safety testers. But for now, that's a different topic. Um, and then we have a lot of different features in most of our electrical safety testers uh, for maximum operator protection, such as ground fault interrupt, a safety interlock, and all that good stuff. So. Here's an example of one of our uh, products here, the Omnia 2, which some of you may be familiar with and have, may have already used it. Uh, the Omnia 2 is a complete electrical safety compliance analyzer capable of performing all, uh, all the electrical safety tests that we've talked about, starting with the ground continuity, ground bond, AC, DC, high pots, insulation resistance, functional run, and your line leakage tests. Uh, so this, on its own, can be considered a complete med test system because those are all the tests uh, that are required by medical standards. Um, again, we have a you know full automation uh, available uh, with our AutoWare 2 software or AutoWare software. A um, few other things, uh, you know, we also have uh, well, in order to find the right tester. Again, I'll emphasize on how important it is to consult with your standards or your, you know, compliance uh, people. Um, complete test details must be available and understood before you go finding the right tester. You must know the types of tests that you're you know, that you are required to perform, and those come out right out of the safety test standards. Then there must there may be some other tests that you would like to perform as an internal requirement as your company requirement and they may not be required by the standard but your best resource is your safety standard and uh, the test parameters and trip levels 
settings must be available and all test requirements must be clear. Again, we looked at some of the examples right out of the standard and they tell you exactly what voltage, what current, what time, and what threshold levels must be set. Associate Research as a company has an excellent customer support to help you guys understand your testing needs and find the, the right tester that best fits your testing, electrical safety testing needs. So give us a call if you're unsure, send us an email, um, you know, we're always available to answer your questions and uh, um, we help you with, you know, very unique applications. So um, feel free to reach out. And uh, we also have on-site training available along with a lot of uh, useful training materials such as uh, white papers, articles, and webinars um, similar to what we're doing today. And these are all recorded so you can archive back in our, you know, in our archive list. And, uh, you know, uh, if you've missed out on any of the webinars, um, you're always welcome to visit our website and, you know, replay that webinar to catch up. And, uh, you know, it's our website is asresearch.com. Um, our phone number is also available here, so feel free to reach out. Next, uh, we're going to talk about what not to do during our, uh, when you're performing the electrical safety tests. Now, as we looked at some of the electrical safety tests, uh, you can tell that, you know, some of these tests are very high current and high voltage applications. So, it is, these tests in itself pose a safety hazard or a shock hazard to the operator. So in order to minimize those shock hazards, there are some tips and, you know, some tricks that you must follow and some precautions that you must take to ensure operator safety. So here's a few pictures um, um, before uh, we go any further. The picture on the extreme right, top right, is basically, uh, you know, showing a product being tested and the operator which in this case is me, is actually touching the product under test. So that's that should not be the case. You should not touch the product that's being tested. In fact, the product should be inside a safety enclosure and, uh, you know, uh, all the safety precautions that, that we've discussed in our previous webinar should be taken in, in setting up a safe test station. Um, so, yeah, on the in the picture in the center, we see one of our um, other applications engineer, Bishan, posing that he's wearing a ESD smog. Again, ESD, you know, electrical, you know, uh, electrostatic discharge does not go well with high voltage testing. So, um, the operator should not be grounded at any point because then all you're doing is, um, you know, um, providing a pad for any discharge on your product to flow through your body instead of the return lead or return connection of the test. Um, in the two pictures at the very bottom right and bottom left, we're showing how a ground pin or a ground circuit of a product is being compromised. There, ha I have seen cases where, you know, uh, you have a three-prong class one product and you just can't find a three-prong outlet, so people would just simply break off the ground pin and, you know, convert it, try and assume that it's being converted into a class 2 product. However, it's not. It still has a ground circuit, but it's not connected. So that's, you're basically putting yourself at risk. And then uh, the picture on the um, top left is uh, showing a person being high potted. So, of course, that's completely prohibited in electrical safety testing. So here's some um, some more uh, tips that we're gonna um, share with you um, in terms of uh, when you're performing electrical safety tests. These are things that you should be careful about and you should not be doing. Starting with, do not ever attempt to perform tests on a product that are not meant to be performed for that product. Meaning that if you're unsure that a certain test is meant for this uh, for your product do not try attempt to perform it because you're not sure if your product is meant for you know performing these types of tests on, on it 
do not attempt to use a testing device if you're not familiar with it. Again, it's very important for, uh, you know, uh, when you're performing electrical safety testing, you must be familiar with the capabilities and the dangers associated in using a test testing device or a, te or a test instrument. Do not attempt to power up a test, de a test device with an unknown power source or outlet. Of course, we as a company provide uh, you with all the information uh, about our testers and what are the the different uh, you know uh, different safety hazards associated with our in our testers and all the accessories that are supposed to be used with our instruments. Uh, we do specify those in our manuals. So do not assume anything about the functionality of a test device. Always read the manual. And if you're still unsure about our products, give us a call, and we'll definitely help you out in understanding, you know, uh, the different risks that are associated with your testing. Again, uh, we saw this in the picture. Do not attempt to defeat the protective ground on the power cord by using an extension cord without a protective conductor, or do not just compromise the ground pin. Um, do not replace the power cord of your device or of the, the safety testing, uh, you know, device with the, an improperly rated cord. Most of the line cords are designed for, uh, you know, the specific products, so do not compromise on that. Make sure you're using the correct one. Also, do not cover or block the vent ventilation slits during operation. Some of our electrical safety testers do tend to heat up because of the high output that they're, they're outputting, and that's why we have... Uh, um, you know, vents and uh, cooling fans, which are there for a purpose. They should not be blocked. If they are blocked, that can pose a safety hazard. Do not attempt to perform any electrical safety tests in or around uh, ESD test areas. Again, ESD, as uh, we discussed in our previous webinar, does not go well with uh, electrical safety testing, so it should be completely avoided. Uh, and again, grounding the test operator can lead to harmful or fatal electric shock. So do not attempt to ground the operator or wear a ESD smog. Also, do not use accessories that are not approved by the manufacturer. Again, you know, we provide accessories that are meant to be used with our products. And uh, if you're if you attempt to use any other accessory that we did not that you did not get from us or it's not rated for this uh, you know our products, you're putting yourself at risk. So that should be avoided. Do not disconnect any test leads while the test is running. Of course, for example, during a high pot test, you're charging up your device with a very high potential. Now, if you disconnect the return lead, for example, you know that your product is uh, fully charged and you're not providing, you've disconnected the discharge path to your product. And if somebody comes in contact with that product that's already fully charged, you know, you're going to provide, or that operator, or whoever comes in contact, is going to provide the discharge path, and that could lead to very bad things. So um, that should be completely avoided. No test leads or nothing should be touched while the test is being performed, and nothing should be, uh, you know, any additional cables, leads uh, to and from the tester should not be used. Do not also attempt to use the tester in environmental conditions that are beyond the specification of the tester. Again, and if you read our product manuals, we specify um, a full set of environmental conditions for which our test instruments or products are rated to work under. If those uh, conditions change or are out of the specifications, then we do not guarantee safety or, um, you know, a optimal performance of our instruments, so do not attempt to use these outside of the conditions specified. So we're basically going to end our webinar at this point, and uh, um, we're going to leave some time open for any questions that you may have. Uh, feel free to use our chat line, and uh, um, you know anything that, that, that's not clear, please uh, feel free to ask. Now is the time. We'll leave a few minutes open for our question and answer session.
All right, looks like uh, at this point we don't have any questions, at least I don't see any, but a few things to note uh, uh, for our future webinars. Um, we do, uh, again, we do archive all our webinars, they're available, and uh, our next webinar uh, is on electrical safety testing circuit theory. Um, on April 15th at 10 a.m. Uh, Central Time USA, so be sure to join us. And uh, again, we encourage you to join us on each and every webinar, of course, uh, because we've we've basically, um, you know, um, planned our webinars as a sequence so we can cover a lot of different topics. And at the end of the year, when we're done with all our webinars, we uh, the the we expect that our Anyone who's attended our webinars will be very well educated with electrical safety testing, and uh, you know, will make you an expert in electrical safety testing. So once again, I don't see any questions uh, here. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today, taking out time and joining us. And uh, again, uh, for if you need the, the presentation for this webinar. Uh, contact Jim Kennessy at uh, asresearch.com. Visit our website on asresearch.com again, and follow us on YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Uh, we have the links on this uh, page that you're seeing right now. And um, once again, um, this is your presenter, Syed Abidi, signing off, and have a great day.